thanks for joining me again for this um, lesson four in our series on pleading the blood of Jesus, asking the question, is it scriptural? And today's lesson, this evening's lesson, and believe it or not, this is actually the last lesson of this particular course, uh, lesson four, uh, with the topic, God's standard for protecting his people. And just to give a recap of the four lessons, of the, the three previous lessons, and uh, we'll look at um, this being the fourth lesson, so we'll look at um, all of them in, in, in total. Um, but just uh, as a recap, in lesson one, we the topic was laying the foundation. And in that particular lesson, what we did was we established some of the principles for rightly dividing the word of truth. And as this is a systematic teaching, and as this is a learning environment, it was necessary to not just dive into the topic about pleading the blood of Jesus uh, with the question or answering the question, is it scriptural? But we also found it necessary to provide principles for study, principles that would aid you in rightly dividing the word of truth. And the reason this is important is because you can apply these same principles to a myriad of different subjects and topics as it pertains to the correct interpretation of scripture. So in particular, we looked at a context of scripture and we also looked at the first mention principle or the, or the principle of first mention. And based on those two uh, principles as it pertains to rightly dividing the word, we were able to lay a solid foundation as it pertains to not um, allowing the Bible to interpret itself and not uh, allowing ourselves to interpret scripture in isolation and also to have the right context and perspective of scripture. And then also, as it pertains to understanding the purpose of blood in scripture, we went to the place in scripture where the purpose of blood was first mentioned. And then in lesson two, we looked at atonement for sin, um, and we covered it with, uh, with great detail Exodus chapter 12. We'll touch on, on that again as it pertains to the Passover. And then we also saw that that was a type and pointed to Christ being our Passover as well. In last week's lesson being lesson three, the topic was blood, the seal of the covenant. And in this particular lesson, we looked at the fact that blood was necessary or blood is a necessity in order to seal or to serve as a seal for the covenant. And, and we looked in particular at three different covenants being uh, the Abrahamic covenant. We also looked at the old covenant or the Mosaic covenant. And then we also looked at the new covenant as well. And so to wrap up this entire course, Lesson four, today's lesson, is God's standard for protecting his people. So if we say then that pleading the blood is not a, um, a standard or is not scriptural as it pertains to the manner in which God protects his people or a mechanism necessary for protection, then we have to examine also not just um, disqualifying that, practice, but we also have to look at what the scripture says as it pertains to how God protects his people. What then is the standard? So it's not just about eliminating bad or poor doctrine, but it's also reinforcing good and righteous uh, doctrine as well. And so before we, we go into it, as I've done in previous lessons, let's look at the objectives of this course. And as I was looking at this earlier today, those of you who have joined us or who have been a part of this course from day one or from lesson one, we, you would, as we go through these objectives, you may be able to identify that we have, um, for the most part, with the exception of this last course, addressed all of these objectives as, as well. And that's what objectives do. They serve as a guide so that you know that you're on course and you're targeting the topics that you set out to address. And so the objectives of this course, and the first one was to reveal the purpose of blood in scripture and how it is used throughout the Bible. And we covered that 
in lesson one. We also addressed it in lesson two with the atonement. And then we also uh, spoke of it in great detail as it pertains to the blood, uh, the purpose of blood as it pertains to the covenant. Um, uh, the, uh, the second objective is to offer the true scriptural perspective regarding the purpose of the blood of Jesus. Uh, again, we dealt with that in lesson two in great detail. It is to communicate from scripture God's standard for protecting his people, and that's what we will uh, discuss this evening. It is also to eliminate the misconceptions regarding concerning the blood of Jesus and replace it with the truth of scripture. And that's what the purpose of the intent has been from day one, not just to disqualify one particular doctrine or teaching, but also to provide a firm foundation as it pertains to what the, the scripture really says or to replace error or false doctrine with truth. And overall, the objective is to show that scripture is an objective standard of truth. And that really that statement encapsulates what we've been discussing in these, um, in the previous three, les three lessons and what we will um, discuss today as well. So that when we look at the scripture, we do not have subjective conclusions, but rather objective ones. And if you remember from the first lesson in, um, in, in laying the foundation, that an objective standard of truth is truth regardless of how we feel or what we think. For example, an objective truth of the scripture is that God is holy. His holiness does not depend on whether I believe it or not. His holiness is not dependent on how I feel or how I think about it or my perspective of it. God is holy regardless of what my thoughts are. And a subjective standard of truth relies on feelings and opinions and personal perspectives. And for example, I gave the illustration of looking at a painting. You may gather several persons and you may have a painting and you may solicit various, uh, their opinions on that particular painting. And everyone may have a different impression of what that painting represents. But that then is a subjective perspective. But we are not to use that same approach when it comes to studying the scriptures. It is not my interpretation and your interpretation or, or whatever. It is only the one interpretation, and that is the objective standard of truth. So in reference to, to looking at subjective conclusions that we've done throughout this course as well, let's look at some of the subjective conclusions as it pertains that the church holds on to as it pertains to pleading the blood. Um, one is that believers can use the blood of Jesus as a weapon for spiritual warfare. And I think that one of the challenges that the faith that the church has is a lack of understanding of what spiritual warfare truly entails. Without going, uh, it, you know, without diverting and going uh, in, in the direction of spiritual warfare and talking about it, I will say uh, in its simplest form, spiritual warfare basically involves two things. It involves guarding against um, error and false doctrine and keeping ourselves holy. Those are the two main tenets of what spiritual warfare addresses. But I will, like I said, I think in a previous lesson, we can build a, a I'll build a, a topic and a teaching around that and we can discuss that at a later point. Also, that the blood of Jesus can be used as a covering for our children, houses, cars, our places of employment, etc. Another subjective conclusion is that the blood of Jesus can be used to provide protection from the devil, our enemies, and from adversities. That the blood of Jesus helps us with our finances. That it provides physical healing for the body. And as I mentioned, during COVID, um, a red string or a ribbon was used to symbolize the blood of Jesus. And many persons put it, they tied it on their cars, they tied it on their homes, um, and other personal effects that they wanted uh, or they sought protection for. However, all of these are based on the doc doctrines of men and are a misinterpretation of what the scripture says. And so as we go through these courses, or these lessons for this particular course, 
It is the objective, the overall objective, like I said, is to provide the objective standard of truth or to provide what does the scripture really say. And so we have so many traditions and so many conclusions that we have, that have been passed down, that have been handed down from generation to generation. And no one uh, oftentimes takes the time to really check to see what the scripture says. And so we believe things, we hold on to things, um, we practice things, but we do not really know, can we truly prove it from what the scripture says? And so that's what these uh, this particular course is intended to do. And so let's look at a, let's do a quick recap um, of the previous lessons so that we, for those who may have not listened uh, from lesson one to now, or even those who have listened and they just need a refresher, let's just go through a recap of, of the lessons very quickly. So from the book of Genesis and all throughout scripture, the purpose of blood has always been associated with redemption and forgiveness of sin. We saw this, as I, as I talked about a few minutes ago, with the first mentioned principle. We, from the book of Genesis, and even all through, when we look at the Old Testament with the sacrifices, blood has always been associated with redemption and forgiveness of sins. So if you hold on to those two tenets, hold on to that, and you will see how it progresses throughout Scripture. We do not see blood being used as a protection from the devil, a protection from adversities, um, for finances or healing or anything of that nature. It has been always associated with redemption and forgiveness of sins. And as we've di discussed with the first mentioned principle, that principle states that if you want to know, uh, if you want to be able to properly establish any doctrine or teaching, pertaining to a particular subject, you go to the place in scripture where it is first mentioned. And that serves as a foundation of how it is used throughout scripture. So from the very in, from the very foundation, um, um, from the beginning, we see that blood was associated with redemption and forgiveness. And that same um, premise is what starts in Genesis and goes throughout the scripture. Also in scripture, it served, as we talked about last week, blood also served um, as a seal of the covenant. And this was evident with the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic or Old Covenant, and the New Covenant that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Also, in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, this solidifies. And how do you know that a teaching is on course? How do you know that what you're saying is being rightly divided? So, for example, we gave the principle of the, the, the concept of the, of the tenet of the first mentioned principle. We established the fact that blood from the very beginning was associated with redemption and forgiveness of sins. And so in building on that foundation, in having a progressive um, pattern, the Bible says in Leviticus chapter 17 and 11, uh, the Lord states that the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altars to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that make it an atonement for the soul. So that there supports what we found in the book of Genesis as it pertains to the purpose of blood, that it is solely for redemption and forgiveness of sins. Because um, Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11 says that it is the blood that make it atonement for the soul. So with blood representing life, the sacrifices of the law were instituted by the Lord for the purpose of atonement. But as we looked at in lesson number two, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse one, it says that the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make the comers there unto perfect. So the measures or the sacrifices of the law were a, was a temporary practice or instrument until the time of reformation, which is until Christ came, who offered himself as the uh, perfect sacrifice and obtain, and obtain eternal redemption and inheritance once and for all. And so blood then brought about atonement for sin. And we talked about this word atonement as well. 
uh, in lesson two. So the word atonement speaks of reconciliation or being at one with God. So when Adam and Eve sinned, humanity became separated from the Lord. In Genesis chapter 2 and 17, God gave Adam a specific instruction. He said that it, um, in reference to eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he says that in the day that you eat of this tree, of, of, the, good and, of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. Now, in short, now this was death in all its facets, but more importantly, it was spiritual death. Um, and spiritual death in its simplest terms simply means separated, to be separated from God. And so just to give you a quick recap. So when God created humanity, he, he made us to have dominion. He made us also in the capacity of a son. So when God created us, he created us in a kingdom environment, and he also created us as a son. So from the very beginning, you have the concept of a house, and you also have the concept of a kingdom. So from the very beginning, humanity or man belong to both the kingdom of God and also belong to the house of God. However, the events in Genesis chapter 3 caused humanity to be separated from the house of God and also estranged or separated from the kingdom of God. So we, humanity in general, were no longer was no longer at one with God anymore, but we were estranged from God or we were separated from God, which was the, which was the effects of Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, that in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. You will be separated from me. You won't be at one with me any longer. But what the sacrifices of the Old Testament did, what is because of, because of atonement, it made humanity at one with God again. And so when Jesus Christ came with the ultimate sacrifice, he obtained eternal redemption and made us at one with God again. And so therefore Leviticus 17 11, as we stated that blood was necessary to make atonement for the soul. So you see the consistency throughout scripture of, of what the purpose of blood is for. It is for redemption. It is for forgiveness of sins. It is for atonement. And also, like we said, it is also it also served as a seal of the covenant. So blood was necessary to reconcile humanity back to God and restore the relationship that was from the very beginning. That's why when Jesus came in, in Matthew in chapter 4, um, he said his first words were, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so his message is that that which was from the beginning, the relationship that was from the beginning, I came to restore you to, to the kingdom um, because humanity from the very beginning belonged to the kingdom of God and belonged to the house of God. So that message was simply a message of restoration. And permit me, please, to say this as well. John chapter 4, John chapter 14, sorry, that when Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me, my Father's house and many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. That has nothing to do with buildings in heaven. It is the same message of restoration, of being restored to the house of God. You will never find anywhere in scripture that the house of God is, ref is in reference to heaven. Jesus' purpose was to do two particular things. It was to restore us to the kingdom of God and to restore us to the house of God. So the message in John chapter 14, verse 1 to 3, and even throughout the rest of the chapter, is a message of being restored back to the house or the family of God. Another topic, another day. We can I can build on that, but I just wanted to establish that based on the message, the overall message uh, of, of atonement. And so when you fast forward the Passover, uh, Exodus chapter 12, the, the Passover represented the principle of life for life. So because a life, the sacrificed lamb, had already been offered, the Israelites were spared from God's judgment. Now you have to keep that in mind 
that it was God who was executing judgment. Somehow the church got it twisted and adopted the notion that the blood was to spare them from the, from the Egyptians, from adversity, or from the devil. It was God who was executing judgment. So when he passed by the home, because they applied the door, the blood to the to the doorpost, it was he passed over them because the blood on the doorpost represented the fact that a life had already been uh, uh, had already been given. So they then were exempted from God's judgment because the Passover represented life for life. Because a life had already been given, their lives were then spared. And so I think one of the challenges with understanding, and we're going to revisit Exodus chapter 12, one of the, the, the challenges with Exodus 12 is that we do not understand the context uh, of, the, of that particular chapter. And going back to lesson one, recall that we talked about context of Scripture and the importance of it. We talked about the passage context. We talked about the book context. We talked about the Testament context. And we also talked about the whole of scripture context. So let's look now at um, the passage context, right? And so if we simply go to Exodus chapter 12 without referencing the previous chapters or even starting at chapter one, which tells the complete thought or the complete story of what happened, what's happening, then we're bypassing the passage context and we're interpreting chapter 12 in isolation, and so we won't get a complete picture. And I always use the example in reference uh, to the book context and a passage context. So a passage context represents, like I said, a, a complete thought, and it, it, it sometimes comprises of, of a combination of, of different chapters. And as I uh, mentioned in, in uh, lesson one, Romans chapter uh, 9, 10, and 11 represents a passage context. And so in the same instance, to understand Exodus chapter 12, we have to go back to Exodus chapter 1, because all of that is involved in the passage context. So in the book of Exodus, the Lord sent Moses and Aaron to Pharaoh with the message to let the Israelites go. And so we see right from there, but, it is, but what's interesting is, because we, we understand and we have an appreciation for the book context, it is a continuation. So we, we grab into Genesis and we understand that the, the covenant, we talked about the covenant last week that God made with Abraham. And so in Genesis, God make, made a covenant with Abraham, and it also was for uh, continued with Isaac and Jacob as well. So when you get to the book of Exodus, God says that he, he's the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, simply referencing the fact that he is a covenant-keeping God. So he remembered the covenant that he made with uh, the patriarchs. And so here then, in the book of Exodus, God calls Moses and gives him a message to give to Pharaoh. And that message is, let my people go because I am a covenant-keeping God. God. And then we see that time and time again, Pharaoh refused. So what then followed was not one judgment or one plague. It was 10 judgments, all executed by the Lord. And I think this is what we sometimes bypass. This is what we sometimes are negligent of because we just want to focus on Exodus chapter 12. So Often the, the circumstances of Exodus chapter 12 are interpreted in isolation without considering um, that the death of the firstborn was only one of the 10 judgments that God executed upon the Egyptians. So just in a in rapid succession, let's just look at these 10 judgments in particular. The first judgment was blood. So all the streams and the rivers and, and even the ponds and even the vessels that they were that, that held water. Every um, everything turned into blood. Then the second judgment was that of frogs. The third judgment was that of gnats. The fourth judgment uh, involved flies. The, the, the fifth judgment involved the death of, of the livestock. The sixth uh, judgment involved boils. The seventh was hail. The eighth judgment, locusts. The ninth judgment, darkness. All of these were judgments that were executed by the Lord. These were not 
judgments from the Egyptians. These were not judgments from adversities or enemies. And what is what is what is um, um, special in this in this whole discussion is when you read from Exodus chapter one and you read straight up to Exodus chapter twelve, you would realize that the Israelites who were dwelling in the land of Goshen were exempted or excluded from these judgments. And so the tenth judgment in Exodus chapter 12, we see the death of the firstborn. And so just as we did in lesson two, I just want to read Exodus chapter 12 so we can establish the premise here. So Exodus chapter 12, 1 to 13, because it's necessary uh, to, to, to mention this because we need to establish or reiterate who exactly is executing judgment. Verse 1 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto, unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. And so, whereas, and I talked about this very briefly uh, during that lesson, whereas in during for the solar um, uh, calendar, we observe January, but the lunar calendar, God is saying then, so in times and seasons, we have to align ourselves with God's calendar in order to truly understand times and seasons. And so the first month, uh, as it pertains to uh, to the calendar here that um, that God is referencing to, is, is actually April. So it says, speak unto the congregation of Israel, um, saying, in the 10th day of this month, um, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. So now he's giving the criteria for the sacrifice. The lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. Ye shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole congregation, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses where they shall eat. So this is where the whole concept of so-called cleaning the blood and applying it to your homes and applying it to different things comes in because of this one chapter, this one particular verse, verse 7, that is taken in isolation, interpreted by itself without considering the entire chapter or the passage contents. Verse 8 says, And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with, uh, with fire and unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat, they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw or sodden at all with water, but roast with fire his legs, his head with his legs, and the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire, and thus ye shall eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Now, as we dealt with in lesson two, let's focus on verse 12. And 13. Who is passing? Who is executing judgment? Verse 12 tells us exactly what, who it is and what's happening. The Lord says, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of, judge, of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token or a sign upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So it wasn't the devil. It wasn't the Egyptians. It wasn't the enemy of, 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 of any sort. It wasn't any type of adver adver adversity or adversary. It was the Lord who was executing judgment. And he said that the blood would serve as a token to him so that when he sees the blood, he will pass over us. And then we fast forward into the New Testament because of the blood of Jesus. So the Passover pointed to the blood of the Jesus, uh, to, to, to the blood of Jesus or the Jesus of sacrifice. And as believers, because we are born again, 
we are also exempted from God's judgment as well. And so somehow this entire passage got twisted to the blood now serves as, serves as a deterrent or serves as a protection from the devil, from adversity, people who are trying to put witchcraft on me, people who are trying to put bad mode on me, and all these types of things, whereas the verse of, and the chapter specifically says that it is God who is executing judgment, and it serves as a witness to him that a life had already been given, hence the Israelites were then exempted from God from his judgment. John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have any everlasting life. Verse 17, For God came not in the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. It is the exact same principle. Because he gave his life, God, we are now exempted from God's judgment, because a life had already been given, we are then exempted from judgment to come. So in accordance with the first Passover, a male lamb without blemish was sacrificed and his blood was placed on the doorposts of the houses of the Israelites. And I'm just reiterating it again. Notice that the Lord said in Exodus 12 and 12 that he will pass through the land of Egypt and he will smite the firstborn. And against the gods of, of Egypt, he will execute judgment because the judgment was executed by the Lord. So the Lord says that when he sees the blood, he will pass over his people and they'll be exempted from his judgment. So the blood served as a token to the Lord that the demands of justice had already been satisfied. Why did blood satisfy this particular uh, requirement? Because of the same principle of life for life. God's righteous judgment demanded life. And so now, just as with us, the wages of sin is death. And so his righteousness demands that a life be given. But because Christ has already given his life, we are now exempted from God's judgment because the demands of justice, the demands of God's righteous judge, um, justice has already been satisfied. So as, as a result of the sacrifice, the Lord passed over or spared the Israelites when he smote the Egyptians and they were exempted or, or spared from his judgment. So based on what the, what the blood represented, it serves as a token or sign and excluding the Israelites from God's judgment. Just uh, reiterating that again. Because the life had already been offered, their lives were spared. So blood, as I said again, satisfied the demands of justice, which is life for life. So based on the context of the passage, now notice I keep using that terminology uh, over and over, based on the context of the passage, because it is, it is a principle for rightly dividing the word. So based on the context of the passage, applying the blood on the doorpost had nothing to do with the devil or his tactics. It had nothing to do with the Egyptians or protection from those considered enemies. It was the Lord who was executing judgment. When he saw the blood, he passed over them, according to Exodus chapter 12, verse 13. So the blood of the Passover never served as a defense from the devil, for, um, from the devil or an enemy. So the blood is not a weapon of spiritual warfare. It was a token of God's mercy. When God saw the blood, it was a witness to him that the demands of justice had already been satisfied. A life had already been given, hence the Israelites were excluded from God's judgment. And so through the blood of Christ, like I mentioned, we are also excluded from the judgment of God. Because the Passover pointed to Christ and the salvation that he would bring. That's why when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said in John chapter 1, verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Also, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says, For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And so we see the types and the shadows and the temporary measures that were implemented in the law be become uh, fulfilled. That's why Jesus says, I am not come to do away with the law and the prophets, but to fulfill 
And let me say this, that he not only came to fulfill, but he came as the fulfillment. He came as the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. He came as the fulfillment of everything that was done in the law that pointed to redemption. And so he then is our Passover. So when Christ died on the cross and shed his blood, he satisfied the demands of justice, which is life for life. And so based on tradition, many believers use the concept of pleading the blood as a means of protection. They use it to protect or cover themselves, their children, their homes, their workplace from the devil, from enemies and from adversities. However, not, is this, not only is this contrary to what the scripture says uh, concerning the, pur the purpose of the blood of Jesus, it is also a false sense of security. It is simply a mental application based on the traditions of men that have been passed on from generation to generation because based on God's word, he only operates based on what his word says. God only functions based on the parameters that are set by his word. So based on the premise established in Exodus chapter 12, it was the Lord who was executing judgment and not the devil. As a result of being born again by the blood of Christ, we are in covenant relationship with the Father. So we talked about last week as it pertains to blood being a seal of the covenant. And so we then, when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we then, because we are at one with God again, because of atonement, we are in a covenant relationship with God. And so recall that in a covenant relationship from last week's lesson, the parties make the cause of the other party their own. And so God then commits himself. We, Because we are in a covenant, the goals and desires of the person with whom we are in covenant relationship with become our very own because a covenant creates unity. And so because we are in a covenant relationship with the Father, as his sons, he is, he is connected and committed to everything that pertains to our safety and our well-being. The fact that we are already in a covenant relationship with God, he protects us because our desires and our goals and our well-being becomes his as well because we are tied with him in a covenant relationship. And the scripture or the words of the covenant provide sufficient examples of God's faithfulness in protecting his people. And it has nothing to do with us handling blood of any sort. So according to the scriptures, God encircles, he, en he, en he encompasses, he protects, he delivers, he covers and shields his people. And he does this based on his promises he does this based on his faithfulness, and he does this based on the fact that we are in covenant relationship with him. And so let's look at several scriptures that talk about how God protects us because he is faithful to his promise, because he is faithful to his covenant. Psalms chapter 31, um, sorry, Psalms chapter 3 and one to five, I'll just give a portion of it. it, says that the Lord is a shield about us. And it goes on to says, he is the glory and the lifter up of our heads. The Lord is a, he is presently a shield about us. We don't need to do anything else other than be faithful to him. He is already a shield about us and surrounds us. This speaks of defense, it speaks of protection, it speaks of deliverance. Uh, additionally, it also is a de declaration of our trust in him. He is already presently a shield about us. Psalms chapter 23 verse 1 says, the Lord is my shepherd. This identifies the Lord as our provider, our protector, our nourisher, our sustainer, and the one who guides us. Psalms chapter 34, verse 7. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. The word encamp speaks of defense. Um, it speaks of protection. 
And it also speaks of the fact that the Lord is a guide for his people. And so we see already that we do not need to come up with different measures to, uh, to create a form of protection for the Lord already has mechanisms based on his faithfulness and his promises to protect us. Psalm chapter 34, verse 19 says, Many are the, the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. So even though, now notice it says, there will be afflictions. There will be difficult situations. There will be temptations. But many, he says, will be the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all because he is our deliverer. Psalms chapter 46, verse 1 says, God is our refuge and our, and our strength. He is a very pleasant help in time of trouble. So God is our shelter from danger. He is a place we can flee for safety. He is, he is also our source of strength when we are weak. So you see that the scriptures have already provide us with ample, um, ample evidence of God's protection. And none of it involves pleading the blood it in simply involves his faithfulness. It involves the fact that we are in covenant relationship with him. Psalms chapter 91 says that he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So those that dwell or abide with God are already under his protection or under his wings. Psalm chapter 121 says, my help. It, it starts off and says, I will look unto the hills. Where does my help come from? So David is, is in the psalm, he's saying, I, I'm looking unto the hills and I am asking a specific question. Where is my help coming from? And he answers and he says, my help cometh from the Lord who made heaven on, on earth. So if there is any uncertainty of where our help or our defense or our protection comes from, it comes from the Lord because in him, we have stability, and in him we have protection. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 10 says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. Simply calling on the name of the Lord provides us with protection. And it says the righteous run into it and are safe. So the name of the Lord is a fortress. He is a place of safety. He is a place, it is a place of strength where his people are protected from the enemy. Isaiah chapter 54, verse uh, 17 says, No weapon formed against us shall prosper. So no instrument fashioned or framed against God's people shall succeed. Also, any tongue that rises up in judgment against his people, they shall condemn as well. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3 says, the Lord, is faith, the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from all evil. So based on God's faithfulness, he shall protect us, strengthen us, and make us uh, stable. 2 Timothy 4 and 18 says, The Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, because the Lord is a deliverer. So in none of these examples is pleading the blood of Jesus a requirement. The concept of pleading the blood of Jesus circumvents what the scripture says regarding God's faithfulness in protecting his people as a, as a result of being in covenant relationship with him. In fact, by doing this, we presume to take matters into our own hands and somehow align it with spiritual warfare. And as I mentioned, when I gave the tenants earlier of what spiritual warfare uh, directly pertains to, that it directly pertains to keeping ourselves holy or buffeting ourselves and modifying uh, the flesh. And then it also has to do with protection against heresy and, and, and false doctrine. So however, in our ignorance and misappropriations, God is still faithful based on the commitments that he has, he has made uh, as it pertains to his word. And so God's faithfulness overrides our ignorance. So even though we may be practicing things or saying things that do not line up with scripture, God is still faithful and he protects us based on the fact that we have covenant relationship with him. And then somehow we think that what we're saying gets the job done. 
but rather it is the faithfulness of God that's actually on display. Because as we've seen all throughout the scripture, blood was associated with covering as a result of sin, remission or forgiveness of sin, redemption and atonement, and as a seal for the covenant. And because of the sanctity of blood and its relevance to life, as I mentioned, the Passover provided the principle of life for life resulting in immunity uh, from, from God's judgment. And so even when you look at the word, uh, what it means to, to plead, the word to plead means to appeal or, or, or request earnestly, means to beg or to provide an argument for. And in our capacity, this is even impossible as we discussed in lesson two, because in lesson two, we identify that it was the high priest who handled blood. So we cannot earnestly request for something. We cannot make an appeal or beg for something. We cannot provide an argument for something that in our capacity as priests, we cannot handle because only the high priest handled blood on the day of atonement. You saw Aaron who went into the holy on into the most holy place, and he sprinkled blood on the mercy seat. And then Christ, following the same pattern, went into, he handled it, he took his own blood. In Hebrews chapter 9, he took his own blood, and uh, he obtained, in the capacity of the high priest, after the order of Melchizedek, he obtained eternal redemption for us. So it is only the high priest on the Day of Atonement that handled it. And moreover, when Christ did this, he sat down on the right hand of the Father, and we are sanctified by the blood of Jesus once and for all, which means that it is a finished work. So the whole handling of, the, of blood, the whole usage of blood has ceased because Christ fulfilled what the Old Testament pointed to. If we determine that blood still needs to be handled, then we are making the conclusion that what Christ did was ineffective. So when we plead the blood of Christ or request it as a covering, we are petitioning God to violate the principles of his word because he only operates and functions within the parameters of his word. However, um, we will not operate outside, he will not operate, sorry, outside the boundaries is, that are established because the blood is not for that purpose. And so based on his word and his faithfulness, he protects us. And so sometimes all we need to do is affirm what he has already done. Simply, as I, as I read uh, some of those passages, just say, God, you are a shield about me at my glory and the lift up of my head. Simply repeat what's already there in scripture. We affirm the words of the covenant. We affirm his faithfulness. And that is all that is required. And in addition to that, we also have to walk in righteousness as well. Um, because Proverbs chapter 18, uh, when it says that the, uh, in reference to the name of the Lord being a strong tower, know what it says, the righteous run into it and are safe. And so there is also a requirement of righteousness as it pertains to the Lord protecting us. And so as we've come to the conclusion of this particular course, I hope, honestly, it is my prayer that, that uh, and these type of lessons, um, as I mentioned even last week, these are the type of lessons that have to be listened to over and over and over again, because it's really a wealth of, of knowledge and a lot of, of information that is being conveyed. Not only that, but when you've heard a particular teaching for 10 and 20 and 30 years, and this is how your mind has been shaped and molded, and this is all that you know, hearing a teaching um, for four weeks or or just if you're listening to this one particular uh, lesson in, uh, isolated from the others, um, it's going to take some time. So please, I implore you, I'm going to, I posted the uh, the first lesson already and I have the, the second lesson. Uh, we posted on YouTube as well and we'll do that for all of the lessons so that you can get them and listen to them over and over and over again so that you can be able then to to absorb it even more so and get the truth of scripture. So we see that overall, based on scripture, blood um, has always been associated with forgiveness of sins. It has been associated with atonement and uh, redemption for sin, and it has nothing to do 
with protection from the devil or from an enemy or anything like that. Simply put, God protects us because we are his sons and that we are in covenant relationship with him. And because we are in covenant relationship with him, he cares for us. He performs his words as it pertains to us. And he, he looks over us based on the faithfulness of his word. Um, and so I hope that you've been blessed uh, by these classes. And I, 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 I thank you.